Chapter One, Part Six of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles McKay, Volume Two chapter one the crusades part six the saracens upon the ramparts beheld all these manifestations without alarm to incense the christians whom they despised they constructed rude crosses and fixed them upon the walls and spat upon and pelted them with dirt and stones this insult to the symbol of their faith raised the wrath of the crusaders to that height that bravery became ferocity and enthusiasm madness when all the engines of war were completed the attack was recommenced and every soldier of the christian army fought with a vigor which the sense of private wrong invariably inspires every man had been personally outraged and the knights worked at the battering rams with as much readiness as the meanest soldiers the saracen arrows and balls of fire fell thick and fast among them but the tremendous rams still heaved against the walls while the best marksmen of the host were busily employed in the several floors of the movable towers in dealing death among the turks upon the battlements godfrey raymond tancred and robert of normandy each upon his tower fought for hours with unwearied energy often repulsed but ever ready to renew the struggle the turks no longer despising the enemy defended themselves with the utmost skill and bravery till darkness brought a cessation of hostilities short was the sleep that night in the christian camp the priests offered up solemn prayers in the midst of the attentive soldiery for the triumph of the cross in this last great struggle and as soon as morning dawned every one was in readiness for the affray the women and children lent their aid the latter running unconcerned to and fro while the arrows fell fast around them bearing water to the thirsty combatants the saints were believed to be aiding their efforts and the army impressed with this idea surmounted difficulties under which a force thrice as numerous but without their faith would have quailed and been defeated raymond of toulouse at last forced his way into the city by escalade while at the very same moment tancred and robert of normandy succeeded in bursting open one of the gates the turks flew to repair the mischief and godfrey of bouillon seeing the battlements comparatively deserted let down the drawbridge of his movable tower and sprang forward followed by all the knights of his train in an instant after the banner of the cross floated upon the walls of jerusalem the crusaders raising once more their redoubtable war cry rushed on from every side and the city was taken the battle raged in the streets for several hours and the christians remembering their insulted faith gave no quarter to young or old male or female sick or strong not one of the leaders thought himself at liberty to issue orders for staying the carnage and if he had he would not have been obeyed the saracens fled in great numbers to the mosque of soliman but they had not time to fortify themselves within it ere the christians were upon them ten thousand persons are said to have perished in that building alone peter the hermit who had remained so long under the veil of neglect was repaid that day for all his zeal and all his sufferings as soon as the battle was over the christians of jerusalem issued forth from their hiding places to welcome their deliverers they instantly recognized the hermit as the pilgrim who years before had spoken to them so eloquently of the wrongs and insults they had endured 
and promised to stir up the princes and people of europe in their behalf they clung to the skirts of his garments in the fervor of their gratitude and vowed to remember him for ever in their prayers many of them shed tears about his neck and attributed the deliverance of jerusalem solely to his courage and perseverance peter afterwards held some ecclesiastical office in the holy city but what it was or what was his ultimate fate history has forgotten to inform us some say that he returned to france and founded a monastery but the story does not rest upon sufficient authority the grand object for which the popular swarms of europe had forsaken their homes was now accomplished the moslem mosques of jerusalem were converted into churches for a purer faith and the mount of calvary and the sepulchre of christ were profaned no longer by the presence or the power of the infidel popular frenzy had fulfilled its mission and as a natural consequence it began to subside from that time forth the news of the capture of jerusalem brought numbers of pilgrims from europe and among others stephen count of chartres and hugh of vermandois to atone for their desertion but nothing like the former enthusiasm existed among the nations thus then ends the history of the first crusade for the better understanding of the second it will be necessary to describe the interval between them and to enter into a slight sketch of the history of jerusalem under its latin kings the long and fruitless wars they continued to wage with the unvanquished saracens and the poor and miserable results which sprang from so vast an expenditure of zeal and so deplorable a waste of human life the necessity of having some recognized chief was soon felt by the crusaders and godfrey de bouillon less ambitious than bohemund or raymond of toulouse gave his cold consent to wield a sceptre which the latter chiefs would have clutched with eagerness he was hardly invested with the royal mantle before the saracens menaced his capital with much vigor and judgment he exerted himself to follow up the advantages he had gained and marching out to meet the enemy before they had time to besiege him in jerusalem he gave them battle at ascalon and defeated them with great loss he did not however live long to enjoy his new dignity being seized with a fatal illness when he had only reigned nine months to him succeeded his brother baldwin of edessa the latter monarch did much to improve the condition of jerusalem and to extend its territory but was not able to make a firm footing for his successors for fifty years in which the history of jerusalem is full of interest to the historical student the crusaders were exposed to fierce and constant hostilities often gaining battles and territory and as often losing them but becoming every day weaker and more divided while the saracens became stronger and more united to harass and root them out the battles of this period were of the most chivalrous character and deeds of heroism were done by the handful of brave knights that remained in syria which have hardly their parallel in the annals of war in the course of time however the christians could not avoid feeling some respect for the courage and admiration for the polished manners and advanced civilization of the saracens so much superior to the rudeness and semi-barbarism of europe at that day difference of faith did not prevent them from forming alliances with the dark-eyed maidens of the east one of the first to set the example of taking a paynim spouse was king baldwin himself and these connections in time became not only frequent but almost universal among such of the knights as had resolved to spend their lives in palestine these eastern ladies were obliged however to submit to the ceremony of baptism before they could be received to the arms of a christian lord these and their offspring 
naturally looked upon the saracens with less hatred than did the zealots who conquered jerusalem and who thought it a sin deserving the wrath of god to spare an unbeliever we find in consequence that the most obstinate battles waged during the reigns of the later kings of jerusalem were fought by the new and raw levies who from time to time arrived from europe lured by the hope of glory or spurred by fanaticism the latter broke without scruple the truces established between the original settlers and the saracens and drew down severe retaliation upon many thousands of their brethren in the faith whose prudence was stronger than their zeal and whose chief desire was to live in peace things remained in this unsatisfactory state till the close of the year eleven forty five when edessa the strong frontier town of the christian kingdom fell into the hands of the saracens the latter were commanded by zengi a powerful and enterprising monarch and after his death by his son nurheddin as powerful and enterprising as his father an unsuccessful attempt was made by the count of edessa to regain the fortress but nurheddin with a large army came to the rescue and after defeating the count with great slaughter marched into edessa and caused its fortifications to be razed to the ground that the town might never more be a bulwark of defence for the kingdom of jerusalem the road to the capital was now open and consternation seized the hearts of the christians nurheddin it was known was only waiting for a favourable opportunity to advance upon jerusalem and the armies of the cross weakened and divided were not in a condition to make any available resistance the clergy were filled with grief and alarm and wrote repeated letters to the pope and the sovereigns of europe urging the expediency of a new crusade for the relief of jerusalem by far the greater number of the priests of palestine were natives of france and these naturally looked first to their own country the solicitations they sent to louis the seventh were urgent and oft repeated and the chivalry of france began to talk once more of arming in defence of the birthplace of jesus the kings of europe whose interest it had not been to take any part in the first crusade began to bestir themselves in this and a man appeared eloquent as peter the hermit to arouse the people as that preacher had done we find however that the enthusiasm of the second did not equal that of the first crusade in fact the mania had reached its climax in the time of peter the hermit and decreased regularly from that period the third crusade was less general than the second and the fourth than the third and so on until the public enthusiasm was quite extinct and jerusalem returned at last to the dominion of its old masters without a convulsion in christendom various reasons have been assigned for this and one very generally put forward is that europe was wearied with continued struggles and had become sick of precipitating itself upon asia m guizot in his admirable lectures upon european civilization successfully combats this opinion and offers one of his own which is far more satisfactory he says in his eighth lecture quote, it has been often repeated that europe was tired of continually invading asia this expression appears to me exceedingly incorrect it is not possible that human beings can be wearied with what they have not done that the labors of their forefathers can fatigue them weariness is a personal not an inherited feeling the men of the thirteenth century were not fatigued by the crusades of the twelfth they were influenced by another cause a great change had taken place in ideas sentiments and social conditions the same desires and the same wants were no longer felt the same things were no longer believed the people refused to believe what their ancestors were persuaded of End quote. this is in fact 
the secret of the change and its truth becomes more apparent as we advance in the history of the crusades and compare the state of the public mind at the different periods when godfrey of bouillon louis the seventh and richard the first were chiefs and leaders of the movement the crusades themselves were the means of operating a great change in national ideas and advancing the civilization of europe in the time of godfrey the nobles were all powerful and all oppressive and equally obnoxious to kings and people during their absence along with that portion of the community the deepest sunk in ignorance and superstition both kings and people fortified themselves against the renewal of aristocratic tyranny and in proportion as they became free became civilized it was during this period that in france the grand center of the crusading madness the communes began to acquire strength and the monarch to possess a practical and not a merely theoretic authority order and comfort began to take root and when the second crusade was preached men were in consequence much less willing to abandon their homes than they had been during the first such pilgrims as had returned from the holy land came back with minds more liberal and expanded than when they set out they had come in contact with a people more civilized than themselves they had seen something more of the world and had lost some portion however small of the prejudice and bigotry of ignorance the institution of chivalry had also exercised its humanizing influence and coming bright and fresh through the ordeal of the crusades had softened the character and improved the hearts of the aristocratic order the trouvères and troubadours singing of love and war in strains pleasing to every class of society helped to root out the gloomy superstitions which at the first crusade filled the minds of all those who were able to think men became in consequence less exclusively under the mental thraldom of the priesthood and lost much of the credulity which formerly distinguished them the crusades appear never to have excited so much attention in england as on the continent of europe not because the people were less fanatical than their neighbors but because they were occupied in matters of graver interest the english were suffering too severely from the recent successful invasion of their soil to have much sympathy to bestow upon the distresses of people so far away as the christians of palestine and we find that they took no part in the first crusade and very little in the second even then those who engaged in it were chiefly norman knights and their vassals and not the saxon franklins and population who no doubt thought in their sorrow as many wise men have thought since that charity should begin at home germany was productive of more zeal in the cause and her raw uncivilized hordes continued to issue forth under the banners of the cross in numbers apparently undiminished when the enthusiasm had long been on the wane in other countries they were sunk at that time in a deeper slough of barbarism than the livelier nations around them and took in consequence a longer period to free themselves from their prejudices in fact the second crusade drew its chief supplies of men from that quarter where alone the expedition can be said to have retained any portion of popularity such was the state of mind of europe when pope eugenius moved by the reiterated entreaties of the christians of syria commissioned saint bernard to preach a new crusade saint bernard was a man eminently qualified for the mission he was endowed with an eloquence of the highest order could move an auditory to tears or laughter or fury as it pleased him and had led a life of such rigid and self-denying virtue that not even calumny could lift her finger and point it at him he had renounced high prospects in the church and contented himself with the simple abbacy of clairvaux in order that he might have the leisure he desired 
to raise his powerful voice against abuses wherever he found them vice met in him an austere and uncompromising reprover no man was too high for his reproach and none too low for his sympathy he was just as well suited for his age as peter the hermit had been for the age preceding he appealed more to the reason his predecessor to the passions peter the hermit collected a mob while saint bernard collected an army both were endowed with equal zeal and perseverance springing in the one from impulse and in the other from conviction and a desire to increase the influence of the church that great body of which he was a pillar and an ornament one of the first converts he made was in himself a host louis the seventh was both superstitious and tyrannical and in a fit of remorse for the infamous slaughter he had authorized at the sacking of vitry he made a vow to undertake the journey to the holy land footnote the sacking of vitry reflects indelible disgrace upon louis the seventh his predecessors had been long engaged in resistance to the outrageous powers assumed by the popes and louis continued the same policy the ecclesiastical chapter of bourges having elected an archbishop without his consent he proclaimed the election to be invalid and took severe and prompt measures against the refractory clergy thibault count de champagne took up arms in defence of the papal authority and entrenched himself in the town of vitry louis immediately took the field to chastise the rebel and he besieged the town with so much vigour that the count was forced to surrender upwards of thirteen hundred of the inhabitants fully one half of whom were women and children took refuge in the church and when the gates of the city were opened and all resistance had ceased louis inhumanely gave orders to set fire to the sacred edifice and a thousand persons perished in the flames End footnote. he was in this disposition when st bernard began to preach and wanted but little persuasion to embark in the cause his example had great influence upon the nobility who impoverished as many of them were by the sacrifices made by their fathers in the holy wars were anxious to repair their ruined fortunes by conquests on a foreign shore these took the field with such vassals as they could command and in a very short time an army was raised amounting to two hundred thousand men at vesely the monarch received the cross from the hands of st bernard on a platform elevated in sight of all the people several nobles three bishops and his queen eleanor of aquitaine were present at this ceremony and enrolled themselves under the banner of the cross st bernard cutting up his red sacerdotal vestments and making crosses of them to be sewn on the shoulders of the people an exhortation from the pope was read to the multitude granting remission of their sins to all who should join the crusade and directing that no man on that holy pilgrimage should encumber himself with heavy baggage and vain superfluities and that the nobles should not travel with dogs or falcons to lead them from the direct road as had happened to so many during the first crusade the command of the army was offered to st bernard but he wisely refused to accept a station for which his habits had unqualified him after consecrating louis with great solemnity at saint denis as chief of the expedition he continued his course through the country stirring up the people wherever he went so high an opinion was entertained of his sanctity that he was thought to be animated by the spirit of prophecy and to be gifted with the power of working miracles many women excited by his eloquence and encouraged by his predictions forsook their husbands and children and clothing themselves in male attire hastened to the war 
saint bernard himself wrote a letter to the pope detailing his success and stating that in several towns there did not remain a single male inhabitant capable of bearing arms and that everywhere castles and towns were to be seen filled with women weeping for their absent husbands but in spite of this apparent enthusiasm the numbers who really took up arms were inconsiderable and not to be compared to the swarms of the first crusade a levy of no more than two hundred thousand men which was the utmost the number amounted to could hardly have depopulated a country like france to the extent mentioned by saint bernard his description of the state of the country appears therefore to have been much more poetical than true suger the able minister of louis endeavoured to dissuade him from undertaking so long a journey at a time when his own dominions so much needed his presence but the king was pricked in his conscience by the cruelties of vitry and was anxious to make the only reparation which the religion of that day considered sufficient he was desirous moreover of testifying to the world that though he could brave the temporal power of the church when it encroached upon his prerogatives he could render all due obedience to its spiritual decrees whenever it suited his interest or tallied with his prejudices to do so suger therefore implored in vain and louis received the pilgrim's staff at st denis and made all preparations for his pilgrimage End of chapter one part six recording by linda johnson chapter one part seven of memoirs of extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles Mackay. Volume 2. Chapter 1. The Crusades. Part 7. In the meantime, St. Bernard passed into Germany, where similar success attended his preaching. The renown of his sanctity had gone before him, and he found everywhere an admiring audience thousands of people who could not understand a word he said flocked around him to catch a glimpse of so holy a man and the knights enrolled themselves in great numbers in the service of the cross each receiving from his hands the symbol of the cause but the people were not led away as in the days of Gottschalk we do not find that they rose in such tremendous masses of two and three hundred thousand men swarming over the country like a plague of locusts still the enthusiasm was very great the extraordinary tales that were told and believed of the miracles worked by the preacher brought the country people from far and near devils were said to vanish at his sight and diseases of the most malignant nature to be cured by his touch footnote philip archdeacon of the cathedral of liege wrote a detailed account of all the miracles performed by saint bernard during thirty-four days of his mission they averaged about ten per day the disciples of saint bernard complained bitterly that the people flocked around their master in such numbers that they could not see half the miracles he performed but they willingly trusted the eyes of others as far as faith in the miracles went and seemed to vie with each other whose credulity should be greatest End footnote. the emperor conrad caught at last the contagion from his subjects and declared his intention to follow the cross the preparations were carried on so vigorously under the orders of conrad that in less than three months he found himself at the head of an army containing at least one hundred and fifty thousand effective men besides a great number of women who followed their husbands and lovers to the war 
one troop of them rode in the attitude and armor of men their chief wore gilt spurs and buskins and thence acquired the epithet of the golden-footed lady conrad was ready to set out long before the french monarch and in the month of june eleven forty seven he arrived before constantinople having passed through hungary and bulgaria without offence to the inhabitants manuel comnenus the greek emperor successor not only to the throne but to the policy of alexius looked with alarm upon the new levies who had come to eat up his capital and imperil its tranquillity too weak to refuse them a passage through his dominions too distrustful of them to make them welcome when they came and too little assured of the advantages likely to result to himself from the war to feign a friendship which he did not feel the greek emperor gave offence at the very outset his subjects in the pride of superior civilization called the germans barbarians while the latter who if semi-barbarous were at least honest and straightforward retorted upon the greeks by calling them double-faced knaves and traitors disputes continually arose between them and conrad who had preserved so much good order among his followers during their passage was unable to restrain their indignation when they arrived at constantinople for some offence or other which the greeks had given them but which is rather hinted at than stated by the scanty historians of the day the germans broke into the magnificent pleasure garden of the emperor where he had a valuable collection of tame animals for which the grounds had been laid out in woods caverns groves and streams that each might follow in captivity his natural habits the enraged germans meriting the name of barbarians that had been bestowed upon them laid waste this pleasant retreat and killed or let loose the valuable animals it contained manuel who is said to have beheld the devastation from his palace windows without power or courage to prevent it was completely disgusted with his guests and resolved like his predecessor alexius to get rid of them on the first opportunity he sent a message to conrad respectfully desiring an interview but the german refused to trust himself within the walls of constantinople the greek emperor on his part thought it compatible neither with his dignity nor his safety to seek the german and several days were spent in insincere negotiations manuel at length agreed to furnish the crusading army with guides to conduct it through asia minor and conrad passed over the hellespont with his forces the advanced guard being commanded by himself and the rear by the warlike bishop of Freisingen. Historians are almost unanimous in their belief that the wily Greek gave instructions to his guides to lead the army of the German emperor into dangers and difficulties. It is certain that instead of guiding them through such districts of Asia Minor as afforded water and provisions, they led them into the wilds of Cappadocia, where neither was to be procured and where they were suddenly attacked by the sultan of the seljukian turks at the head of an immense force the guides whose treachery is apparent from this fact alone fled at the first sight of the turkish army and the christians were left to wage unequal warfare with their enemy entangled and bewildered in desert wilds toiling in their heavy mail the Germans could make but little effective resistance to the attacks of the Turkish light horse, who were down upon them one instant and out of sight the next. Now in the front and now in the rear, the agile foe showered his arrows upon them, enticing them into swamps and hollows from which they could only extricate themselves after long struggles and great losses the germans confounded by this mode of warfare lost all conception of the direction they were pursuing and went back instead of forward 
suffering at the same time for want of provisions they fell an easy prey to their pursuers count bernhard one of the bravest leaders of the german expedition was surrounded with his whole division not one of whom escaped the turkish arrows the emperor himself had nearly fallen a victim and was twice severely wounded so persevering was the enemy and so little able were the germans to make even a shoe of resistance that when conrad at last reached the city of nice he found that instead of being at the head of an imposing force of one hundred thousand foot and seventy thousand horse he had but fifty or sixty thousand men and these in the most worn and wearied condition totally ignorant of the treachery of the greek emperor although he had been warned to beware of it louis the seventh proceeded at the head of his army through worms and ratisbon towards constantinople at ratisbon he was met by a deputation from manuel bearing letters so full of hyperbole and flattery that louis is reported to have blushed when they were read to him by the bishop of langres the object of the deputation was to obtain from the french king a promise to pass through the grecian territories in a peaceable and friendly manner and to yield to the greek emperor any conquest he might make in asia minor the first part of the proposition was immediately acceded to but no notice was taken of the second and more unreasonable louis marched on and passing through hungary pitched his tents in the outskirts of constantinople on his arrival manuel sent him a friendly invitation to enter the city at the head of a small train louis at once accepted it and was met by the emperor at the porch of his palace the fairest promises were made every art that flattery could suggest was resorted to and every argument employed to induce him to yield his future conquests to the greek louis obstinately refused to pledge himself and returned to his army convinced that the emperor was a man not to be trusted negotiations were however continued for several days to the great dissatisfaction of the french army the news that arrived of a treaty entered into between manuel and the turkish sultan changed their dissatisfaction into fury and the leaders demanded to be led against constantinople swearing that they would raise the treacherous city to the ground louis did not feel inclined to accede to this proposal and breaking up his camp he crossed over into asia here he heard for the first time of the mishaps of the german emperor whom he found in a woeful plight under the walls of nice the two monarchs united their forces and marched together along the sea-coast to ephesus but conrad jealous it would appear of the superior numbers of the french and not liking to sink into a vassal for the time being of his rival withdrew abruptly with the remnant of his legions and returned to constantinople manuel was all smiles and courtesy he condoled with the germans so feelingly upon his losses and cursed the stupidity or treachery of the guides with such apparent heartiness that conrad was half inclined to believe in his sincerity louis marching onward in the direction of jerusalem came up with the enemy on the banks of the meander the turks contested the passage of the river but the french bribed a peasant to point out a ford lower down crossing the river without difficulty they attacked the turks with much vigor and put them to flight whether the turks were really defeated or merely pretended to be so is doubtful but the latter supposition seems to be the true one it is probable that it was part of a concerted plan to draw the invaders onwards to more unfavorable ground where their destruction might be more certain if such were the scheme it succeeded to the heart's wish of its projectors the crusaders 
on the third day after their victory arrived at a steep mountain pass on the summit of which the turkish host lay concealed so artfully that not the slightest vestige of their presence could be perceived quote, with laboring steps and slow end quote, they toiled up the steep ascent when suddenly a tremendous fragment of rock came bounding down the precipices with an awful crash bearing dismay and death before it at the same instant the turkish archers started from their hiding places and discharged a shower of arrows upon the foot soldiers who fell by hundreds at a time the arrows rebounded harmlessly against the iron mail of the knights which the turks observing took aim at their steeds and horse and rider fell down the steep into the rapid torrent which rushed below louis who commanded the rear guard received the first intimation of the onslaught from the sight of the wounded and flying soldiers and not knowing the numbers of the enemy he pushed vigorously forward to stay by his presence the panic which had taken possession of his army all his efforts were in vain immense stones continued to be hurled upon them as they advanced bearing men and horse before them and those who succeeded in forcing their way to the top were met hand to hand by the turks and cast down headlong upon their companions louis himself fought with the energy of desperation but had great difficulty to avoid falling into the enemy's hands he escaped at last under cover of the night with the remnant of his forces and took up his position before atalia here he restored the discipline and the courage of his disorganized and disheartened followers and debated with his captains the plan that was to be pursued after suffering severely both from disease and famine it was resolved that they should march to antioch which still remained an independent principality under the successors of bohemond of tarentum at this time the sovereignty was vested in the person of raymond the uncle of eleanor of aquitaine this prince presuming upon his relationship to the french queen endeavored to withdraw louis from the grand object of the crusade the defense of the kingdom of jerusalem and secure his cooperation in extending the limits and the power of his principality of antioch the prince of tripoli formed a similar design but louis rejected the offers of both and marched after a short delay to jerusalem the emperor conrad was there before him having left constantinople with promises of assistance from manuel comnenus assistance which never arrived and was never intended a great council of the christian princes of palestine and the leaders of the crusade was then summoned to discuss the future operations of the war it was ultimately determined that it would further the cause of the cross in a greater degree if the united armies instead of proceeding to edessa laid siege to the city of damascus and drove the saracens from that strong position this was a bold scheme and had it been boldly followed out would have ensured in all probability the success of the war but the christian leaders never learned from experience the necessity of union that very soul of great enterprises though they all agreed upon the policy of the plan yet every one had his own notions as to the means of executing it the princes of antioch and tripoli were jealous of each other and of the king of jerusalem the emperor conrad was jealous of the king of france and the king of france was disgusted with them all but he had come out to palestine in accordance with a solemn vow his religion though it may be called bigotry was sincere and he determined to remain to the very last moment that a chance was left of effecting any good for the cause he had set his heart on 
the siege of damascus was accordingly commenced and with so much ability and vigour that the christians gained a considerable advantage at the very outset for weeks the siege was pressed till the shattered fortifications and diminishing resistance of the besieged gave evidence that the city could not hold out much longer at that moment the insane jealousy of the leaders led to dissensions that soon caused the utter failure not only of the siege but of the crusade a modern cookery book in giving a recipe for cooking a hare says quote, first catch your hare and then kill it end quote, a maxim of indisputable wisdom the christian chiefs on this occasion had not so much sagacity for they began a violent dispute among themselves for the possession of a city which was still unconquered there being already a prince of antioch and a prince of tripoli twenty claimants started for the principality of damascus and a grand council of the leaders was held to determine the individual on whom the honor should devolve many valuable days were wasted in this discussion the enemy in the meanwhile gaining strength from their inactivity it was at length after a stormy deliberation agreed that count robert of flanders who had twice visited the holy land should be invested with the dignity the other claimants refused to recognize him or to cooperate in the siege until a more equitable arrangement had been made suspicion filled the camp the most sinister rumors of intrigues and treachery were set afloat and the discontented candidates withdrew at last to the other side of the city and commenced operations on their own account without a probability of success they were soon joined by the rest of the army the consequence was that the weakest side of the city and that on which they had already made considerable progress in the work of demolition was left uncovered the enemy was prompt to profit by the mistake and received an abundant supply of provisions and refortified the walls before the crusaders came to their senses again when this desirable event happened it was too late saf eddin the powerful emir of Mosul, was in the neighborhood at the head of a large army advancing by forced marches to the relief of the city the siege was abruptly abandoned and the foolish crusaders returned to jerusalem having done nothing to weaken the enemy but everything to weaken themselves the freshness of enthusiasm had now completely subsided even the meanest soldiers were sick at heart conrad from whose fierce zeal at the outset so much might have been expected was wearied with reverses and returned to europe with the poor remnant of his host louis lingered a short time longer for very shame but the pressing solicitations of his minister suger induced him to return to france thus ended the second crusade its history is but a chronicle of defeats it left the kingdom of jerusalem in a worse state than when it quitted europe and gained nothing but disgrace for its leaders and discouragement for all concerned saint bernard who had prophesied a result so different fell after this into some disrepute and experienced like many other prophets the fate of being without honor in his own country what made the matter worse he could not obtain it in any other still however there were not wanting zealous advocates to stand forward in his behalf and stem the tide of incredulity which unopposed would have carried away his reputation the bishop of freisingen declared that prophets were not always able to prophesy and that the vices of the crusaders drew down the wrath of heaven upon them but the most ingenious excuse ever made for saint bernard is to be found in his life by geoffroy de clairvaux where he pertinaciously insists that the crusade was not unfortunate 
St. Bernard, he says, had prophesied a happy result, and that result could not be considered other than happy, which had peopled heaven with so glorious an army of martyrs. Geoffroy was a cunning pleader, and, no doubt, convinced a few of the zealous. But plain people, who were not wanting even in those days, retained their own opinion, or, what amounts to the same thing, quote, were convinced against their will. End quote. We now come to the consideration of the Third Crusade and of the causes which rendered it necessary. The epidemic frenzy, which had been cooling ever since the issue of the first expedition, was now extinct, or very nearly so, and the nations of Europe looked with cold indifference upon the armaments of their princes. But chivalry had flourished in its natural element of war, and was now in all its glory. It continued to supply armies for the Holy Land when the popular ranks refused to deliver up their able-bodied swarms. Poetry, which more than religion inspired the Third Crusade, was then but, quote, caviar to the million, end quote, who had other matters of sterner import to claim all their attention. But the knights and their retainers listened with delight to the martial and amatory strains of the minstrels, minnesangers, trouvères, and troubadours, and burned to win favor in ladies' eyes by shewing prowess in the Holy Land. The third was truly the romantic era of the Crusades. Men fought then not so much for the sepulchre of Jesus, and the maintenance of a christian kingdom in the east as to gain glory for themselves in the best and almost only field where glory could be obtained they fought not as zealots but as soldiers not for religion but for honour not for the crown of martyrdom but for the favour of the lovely it is not necessary to enter into a detail of the events by which saladin attained the sovereignty of the east or how after a succession of engagements he planted the moslem banner once more upon the battlements of jerusalem the christian knights and population including the grand orders of st john the hospitallers and the templars were sunk in an abyss of vice and torn by unworthy jealousies and dissensions, were unable to resist the well-trained armies which the wise and mighty Saladin brought forward to crush them. But the news of their fall created a painful sensation among the chivalry of Europe, whose noblest members were linked to the dwellers in Palestine by many ties, both of blood and friendship the news of the great battle of tiberius in which saladin defeated the christian host with terrible slaughter arrived first in europe and was followed in quick succession by that of the capture of jerusalem antioch tripoli and other cities dismay seized upon the clergy the pope urban the third was so affected by the news that he pined away for grief and was scarcely seen to smile again, until he sank into the sleep of death. His successor, Gregory the Eighth, felt the loss as acutely, but had better strength to bear it, and instructed all the clergy of the Christian world to stir up the people to arms for the recovery of the Holy Sepulchre. William, Archbishop of Tyre, a humble follower in the path of Peter the Hermit, left Palestine to preach to the kings of Europe the miseries he had witnessed, and to incite them to the rescue. The renowned Frederick Barbarossa, the emperor of Germany, speedily collected an army, and passing over into Syria with less delay than had ever before awaited a crusading force, defeated the Saracens and took possession of the city of Iconium he was unfortunately cut off in the middle of his successful career by imprudently bathing in the sidness footnote the desire of comparing two great men has tempted many writers to drown frederick in the river sidness 
in which alexander so imprudently bathed but from the march of the emperor i rather judge that his salaf is the calicadnus a stream of less fame but of a longer course gibbon End footnote. while he was overheated and the duke of swabia took the command of the expedition the latter did not prove so able a general and met with nothing but reverses although he was enabled to maintain a footing at antioch until assistance arrived from europe End of chapter one part seven recording by linda johnson chapter one part eight of memoirs of extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles McKay Volume 2 Chapter 1 The Crusades Part 8 Henry the Second of England and Philip Augustus of France, at the head of their chivalry, supported the crusade with all their influence until wars and dissensions nearer home estranged them from it for a time the two kings met at gisors in normandy in the month of january eleven eighty eight accompanied by a brilliant train of knights and warriors william of tyre was present and expounded the cause of the cross with considerable eloquence and the whole assembly bound themselves by oath to proceed to jerusalem it was agreed at the same time that a tax called saladin's tithe and consisting of the tenth part of all possessions whether landed or personal should be enforced over christendom upon every one who was either unable or unwilling to assume the cross the lord of every fife whether lay or ecclesiastical was charged to raise the tithe within his own jurisdiction and any one who refused to pay his quota became by that act the bondsman and absolute property of his lord at the same time the greatest indulgence was shown to those who assumed the cross no man was at liberty to stay them by process of any kind whether for debt or robbery or murder the king of france at the breaking up of the conference summoned a parliament at paris where these resolutions were solemnly confirmed while henry the second did the same for his norman possessions at rouen and for england at geddington in northamptonshire to use the words of an ancient chronicler he held a parliament about the voyage into the holy land and troubled the whole land with the paying of tithes towards it but it was not england alone that was troubled by the tax the people of france also looked upon it with no pleasant feelings and appear from that time forth to have changed their indifference for the crusade into aversion even the clergy who were exceedingly willing that other people should contribute half or even all their goods in furtherance of their favorite scheme were not at all anxious to contribute a single sou themselves millot relates that several of them cried out against the impost among the rest the clergy of rheims were called upon to pay their quota but sent a deputation to the king begging him to be contented with the aid of their prayers as they were too poor to contribute in any other shape philip augustus knew better and by way of giving them a lesson employed three nobles of the vicinity to lay waste the church lands the clergy informed of the outrage applied to the king for redress i will aid you with my prayers said the monarch condescendingly and will entreat those gentlemen to let the church alone he did as he had promised but in such a manner that the nobles who appreciated the joke continued their devastations as before again the clergy applied to the king 
what would you have of me he replied in answer to their remonstrances you gave me your prayers in my necessity and i have given you mine in yours the clergy understood the argument and thought it the wiser course to pay their quota of saladin's tithe without further parley this anecdote shows the unpopularity of the crusade if the clergy disliked to contribute it is no wonder that the people felt still greater antipathy but the chivalry of europe was eager for the affray the tithe was rigorously collected and armies from england france burgundy italy flanders and germany were soon in the field the two kings who were to have led it were however drawn into broils by an aggression of richard duke of guyenne better known as richard Cour de Lyon, upon the territory of the count of toulouse and the proposed journey to palestine was delayed war continued to rage between france and england and with so little probability of a speedy termination that many of the nobles bound to the crusade left the two monarchs to settle the differences at their leisure and proceeded to palestine without them death at last stepped in and removed henry the second from the hostility of his foes and the treachery and ingratitude of his children his son richard immediately concluded an alliance with philip augustus and the two young valiant and impetuous monarchs united all their energies to forward the crusade they met with a numerous and brilliant retinue at nonancourt in normandy where in sight of their assembled chivalry they embraced as brothers and swore to live as friends and true allies until a period of forty days after their return from the holy land with a view of purging their camp from the follies and vices which had proved so ruinous to preceding expeditions they drew up a code of laws for the government of the army gambling had been carried to a great extent and proved the fruitful source of quarrels and bloodshed and one of their laws prohibited any person in the army beneath the degree of a knight from playing at any game for money knights and clergymen might play for money but no one was permitted to lose or gain more than twenty shillings in a day under a penalty of one hundred shillings the personal attendants of the monarchs were also allowed to play to the same extent the penalty in their case for infraction was that they should be whipped naked through the army for the space of three days any crusader who struck another and drew blood was ordered to have his hand cut off and whoever slew a brother crusader was condemned to be tied alive to the corpse of his victim and buried with him no young women were allowed to follow the army to the great sorrow of many vicious and of many virtuous dames who had not courage to elude the decree by dressing in male attire but many high-minded and affectionate maidens and matrons bearing the sword or the spear followed their husbands and lovers to the war in spite of king richard and in defiance of danger the only women allowed to accompany the army in their own habiliments were washerwomen of fifty years complete and any others of the fair sex who had reached the same age these rules having been promulgated the two monarchs marched together to lyon where they separated agreeing to meet again at messina philip proceeded across the alps to genoa where he took ship and was conveyed in safety to the place of rendezvous richard turned in the direction of marseilles where he also took ship for messina his impetuous disposition hurried him into many squabbles by the way and his knights and followers for the most part as brave and as foolish as himself imitated him very zealously in this particular at messina the sicilians charged the most exorbitant prices for every necessary of life richard's army in vain remonstrated from words they came to blows and as a last resource plundered the sicilians 
since they could not trade with them continual battles were the consequence in one of which lebrun the favorite attendant of richard lost his life the peasantry from far and near came flocking to the aid of the townspeople and the battle soon became general richard irritated at the loss of his favorite and incited by report that tancred the king of sicily was fighting at the head of his own people joined the melee with his boldest knights and beating back the sicilians attacked the city sword in hand stormed the battlements tore down the flag of sicily and planted his own in its stead this collision gave great offence to the king of france who became from that time jealous of richard and apprehensive that his design was not so much to re-establish the christian kingdom of jerusalem as to make conquests for himself he however exerted his influence to restore peace between the english and sicilians and shortly afterwards set sail for acre with distrust of his ally germinating in his heart richard remained behind for some weeks in a state of inactivity quite unaccountable in one of his temperament he appears to have had no more squabbles with the sicilians but to have lived an easy luxurious life forgetting in the lap of pleasure the objects for which he had quitted his own dominions and the dangerous laxity he was introducing into his army the superstition of his soldiers recalled him at length to a sense of his duty a comet was seen for several successive nights which was thought to menace them with the vengeance of heaven for their delay shooting stars gave them similar warning and a fanatic of the name of joachim with his drawn sword in his hand and his long hair streaming wildly over his shoulders went through the camp howling all night long and predicting plague famine and every other calamity if they did not set out immediately richard did not deem it prudent to neglect the intimations and after doing humble penance for his remissness he set sail for acre a violent storm dispersed his fleet but he arrived safely at rhodes with the principal part of the armament here he learned that three of his ships had been stranded on the rocky coasts of cyprus and that the ruler of the island isaac comnenus had permitted his people to pillage the unfortunate crews and had refused shelter to his betrothed bride the princess berengaria and his sister who in one of the vessels had been driven by stress of weather into the port of limiso the fiery monarch swore to be revenged and collecting all his vessels sailed back to limiso isaac comnenus refused to apologize or explain and richard in no mood to be trifled with landed on the island routed with great loss the forces sent to oppose him and laid the whole country under contribution on his arrival at acre he found the whole of the chivalry of europe there before him guy of lusignan the king of jerusalem had long before collected the bold knights of the temple the hospital and st john and had laid siege to acre which was resolutely defended by the sultan saladin with an army magnificent both for its numbers and its discipline for nearly two years the crusaders had pushed the siege and made efforts almost superhuman to dislodge the enemy various battles had taken place in the open fields with no decisive advantage to either party and guy of lusignan had begun to despair of taking that strong position without aid from europe his joy was extreme on the arrival of philip with all his chivalry and he only awaited the coming of cour de lyon to make one last decisive attack upon the town when the fleet of england was first seen approaching the shores of syria a universal shout arose from the christian camp and when richard landed with his train one louder still pierced to the very mountains of the south 
where Saladin lay with all his army. It may be remarked as characteristic of this crusade that the Christians and the Moslems no longer looked upon each other as barbarians to whom mercy was a crime. Each host entertained the highest admiration for the bravery and magnanimity of the other, and in their occasional truces met upon the most friendly terms. The Moslem warriors were full of courtesy to the Christian knights, and had no other regret than to think that such fine fellows were not Mohammedans. The Christians, with a feeling precisely similar, extolled to the skies the nobleness of the Saracens, and sighed to think that such generosity and valor should be sullied by disbelief in the gospel of Jesus. But when the strife began, all these feelings disappeared, and the struggle became mortal. The jealousy excited in the mind of Philip by the events of Messina still rankled, and the two monarchs refused to act in concert. Instead of making a joint attack upon the town, the French monarch assailed it alone and was repulsed. Richard did the same, and with the same result. Philip tried to seduce the soldiers of Richard from their allegiance by the offer of three gold pieces per month to every knight who would forsake the banners of England for those of France. Richard endeavored to neutralize the offer by a larger one, and promised four pieces to every French knight who should join the Lion of England. In this unworthy rivalry, their time was wasted, to the great detriment of the discipline and efficiency of their followers. Some good was nevertheless effected, for the mere presence of two such armies prevented the besieged city from receiving supplies, and the inhabitants were reduced by famine to the most woeful straits. Saladin did not deem it prudent to risk a general engagement by coming to their relief, but preferred to wait till dissension had weakened his enemy and made him an easy prey. Perhaps if he had been aware of the real extent of the extremity in Accra, he would have changed his plan, but, cut off from the town, he did not know its misery till it was too late. After a short truce, the city capitulated upon terms so severe that Saladin afterwards refused to ratify them, the chief conditions were that the precious wood of the true cross captured by the moslems in jerusalem should be restored that a sum of two hundred thousand gold pieces should be paid and that all the christian prisoners in acre should be released together with two hundred knights and a thousand soldiers detained in captivity by saladin the eastern monarch as may be well conceived did not set much store on the wood of the cross, but was nevertheless anxious to keep it, as he knew its possession by the Christians would do more than a victory to restore their courage. He refused, therefore, to deliver it up, or to accede to any of the conditions, and Richard, as he had previously threatened, barbarously ordered all the Saracen prisoners in his power to be put to death the possession of the city only caused new and unhappy dissensions between the christian leaders the archduke of austria unjustifiably hoisted his flag on one of the towers of acre which richard no sooner saw than he tore it down with his own hands and trampled it under his feet philip though he did not sympathize with the archduke was piqued at the assumption of richard and the breach between the two monarchs became wider than ever. A foolish dispute arose at the same time between Guy of Lusignan and Conrad of Montferrat for the crown of Jerusalem. The inferior knights were not slow to imitate the pernicious example, and jealousy, distrust, and ill-will reigned in the Christian camp. In the midst of this confusion, the king of france suddenly announced his intention to return to his own country richard was filled with indignation and exclaimed eternal shame light on him and on all france if for any cause he leave this work unfinished but philip was not to be stayed his health had suffered by his residence in the east and 
ambitious of playing a first part he preferred to play none at all than to play second to king richard leaving a small detachment of burgundians behind he returned to france with the remainder of his army and cour de lyon without feeling in the multitude of his rivals that he had lost the greatest became painfully convinced that the right arm of the enterprise was lopped off after his departure richard refortified acre restored the christian worship in the churches and leaving a christian garrison to protect it marched along the seacoast towards ascalon saladin was on the alert and sent his light horse to attack the rear of the christian army while he himself miscalculating their weakness since the defection of philip endeavoured to force them to a general engagement the rival armies met near azotus a fierce battle ensued in which saladin was defeated and put to flight and the road to jerusalem left free for the crusaders again discord exerted its baleful influence and prevented richard from following up his victory his opinion was constantly opposed by the other leaders all jealous of his bravery and influence and the army instead of marching to jerusalem or even to ascalon as was first intended proceeded to jaffa and remained in idleness until saladin was again in a condition to wage war against them many months were spent in fruitless hostilities and as fruitless negotiations richard's wish was to recapture jerusalem but there were difficulties in the way which even his bold spirit could not conquer his own intolerable pride was not the least cause of the evil for it estranged many a generous spirit who would have been willing to cooperate with him in all cordiality at length it was agreed to march to the holy city but the progress made was so slow and painful that the soldiers murmured and the leaders meditated retreat the weather was hot and dry and there was little water to be procured saladin had choked up the wells and cisterns on the route and the army had not zeal enough to push forward amid such privation at bethlehem a council was held to debate whether they should retreat or advance retreat was decided upon and immediately commenced it is said that richard was first led to a hill whence he could obtain a sight of the towers of jerusalem and that he was so affected at being so near it and so unable to relieve it that he hid his face behind his shield and sobbed aloud End of chapter 1, part 8. Recording by Linda Johnson. Chapter 1, part 9 of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles Mackay, Volume 2, Chapter 1, The Crusades, Part 9. The army separated into two divisions, the smaller falling back upon Jaffa, and the larger, commanded by Richard and the Duke of Burgundy, returning to Acre, before the english monarch had made all his preparations for his return to europe a messenger reached acre with the intelligence that jaffa was besieged by saladin and that unless relieved immediately the city would be taken the french under the duke of burgundy were so wearied with the war that they refused to aid their brethren in jaffa richard blushing with shame at their pusillanimity called his english to the rescue and arrived just in time to save the city his very name put the saracens to flight so great was their dread of his prowess saladin regarded him with the warmest admiration and when richard after his victory demanded peace 
willingly acceded a truce was concluded for three years and eight months during which christian pilgrims were to enjoy the liberty of visiting jerusalem without hindrance or payment of any tax the crusaders were allowed to retain the cities of tyre and jaffa with the country intervening saladin with a princely generosity invited many of the christians to visit jerusalem and several of the leaders took advantage of his offer to feast their eyes upon a spot which all considered so sacred many of them were entertained for days in the sultan's own palace from which they returned with their tongues laden with the praises of the noble infidel richard and saladin never met though the impression that they did will remain on many minds who have been dazzled by the glorious fiction of sir walter scott but each admired the prowess and nobleness of soul of his rival and agreed to terms far less onerous than either would have accepted had this mutual admiration not existed footnote richard left a high reputation in palestine so much terror did his name occasion that the women of syria used it to frighten their children for ages afterwards every disobedient child became still when told that king richard was coming even men shared the panic that his name created and a hundred years afterwards whenever a horse shied at any object in the way his rider would exclaim what dost thou think king richard is in the bush End footnote. the king of england no longer delayed his departure for messengers from his own country brought imperative news that his presence was required to defeat the intrigues that were fomenting against his crown his long imprisonment in the austrian dominions and final ransom are too well known to be dwelt upon and thus ended the third crusade less destructive of human life than the first two but quite as useless the flame of popular enthusiasm now burned pale indeed and all the efforts of popes and potentates were insufficient to rekindle it at last after flickering unsteadily like a lamp expiring in the socket it burned up brightly for one final instant and was extinguished for ever the fourth crusade as connected with popular feeling requires little or no notice at the death of saladin which happened a year after the conclusion of his truce with richard of england his vast empire fell to pieces his brother saif eddin or safadin seized upon syria in the possession of which he was troubled by the sons of saladin when this intelligence reached europe the pope celestine the third judged the moment favorable for preaching a new crusade but every nation in europe was unwilling and cold towards it the people had no ardor and kings were occupied with more weighty matters at home the only monarch of europe who encouraged it was the emperor henry of germany under whose auspices the dukes of saxony and bavaria took the field at the head of a considerable force they landed in palestine and found anything but a welcome from the christian inhabitants under the mild sway of saladin they had enjoyed repose and toleration and both were endangered by the arrival of the germans they looked upon them in consequence as over officious intruders and gave them no encouragement in the warfare against saffadin the result of this crusade was even more disastrous than the last for the germans contrived not only to embitter the saracens against the christians of judea but to lose the strong city of jaffa and cause the destruction of nine-tenths of the army with which they had quitted europe and so ended the fourth crusade the fifth was more important and had a result which its projectors never dreamed of no less than the sacking of constantinople and the placing of a french dynasty upon the imperial throne of the eastern caesars each succeeding pope however much he may have differed from his predecessors on other points zealously agreed in one 
that of maintaining by every possible means the papal ascendancy no scheme was so likely to aid in this endeavor as the crusades as long as they could persuade the kings and nobles of europe to fight and die in syria their own sway was secured over the minds of men at home such being their object they never inquired whether a crusade was or was not likely to be successful whether the time were well or ill chosen or whether men and money could be procured in sufficient abundance pope innocent the third would have been proud if he could have bent the refractory monarchs of england and france into so much submission but john and philip augustus were both engaged both had deeply offended the church and had been laid under her ban and both were occupied in important reforms at home philip in bestowing immunities upon his subjects and john in having them forced from him the emissaries of the pope therefore plied them in vain but as in the first and second crusades the eloquence of a powerful preacher incited the nobility and through them a certain portion of the people Fulk, bishop of neuilly an ambitious and enterprising prelate entered fully into the views of the court of rome and preached the crusade wherever he could find an audience chance favored him to a degree he did not himself expect for he had in general found but few proselytes and those few but cold in the cause theobald count of champagne had instituted a grand tournament to which he had invited all the nobles from far and near upwards of two thousand knights were present with their retainers besides a vast concourse of people to witness the sports in the midst of the festivities fulk arrived on the spot and conceiving the opportunity to be a favorable one he addressed the multitude in eloquent language and passionately called upon them to enroll themselves for the new crusade the count de champagne young ardent and easily excited received the cross at his hands the enthusiasm spread rapidly charles count of blois followed the example and of the two thousand knights present scarcely one hundred and fifty refused the popular frenzy seemed on the point of breaking out as in the days of yore the count of flanders the count of bar the duke of burgundy and the marquis of montferrat brought all their vassals to swell the train and in a very short space of time an effective army was on foot and ready to march to palestine the dangers of an overland journey were too well understood and the crusaders endeavored to make a contract with some of the italian states to convey them over in their vessels dandolo the aged doge of venice offered them the galleys of the republic but the crusaders on their arrival in that city found themselves too poor to pay even half the sum demanded every means was tried to raise money the crusaders melted down their plate and ladies gave up their trinkets contributions were solicited from the faithful but came in so slowly as to make it evident to all concerned that the faithful of europe were outnumbered by the prudent as a last resource dandolo offered to convey them to palestine at the expense of the republic if they would previously aid in the recapture of the city of zara which had been seized from the venetians a short time previously by the king of hungary the crusaders consented much to the displeasure of the pope who threatened excommunication upon all who should be turned aside from the voyage to jerusalem but notwithstanding the fulminations of the church the expedition never reached palestine the siege of zara was speedily undertaken after a long and brave defence the city surrendered at discretion and the crusaders were free if they had so chosen it to use their swords against the saracens but the ambition of the chiefs had been directed by unforeseen circumstances elsewhere after the death 
of manuel comnenus the greek empire had fallen a prey to intestine divisions his son alexius the second had succeeded him but was murdered after a short reign by his uncle andronicus who seized upon the throne his reign also was but of short duration isaac angelos a member of the same family took up arms against the usurper and having defeated and captured him in a pitched battle had him put to death he also mounted the throne only to be cast down from it his brother alexius deposed him and to incapacitate him from reigning put out his eyes and shut him up in a dungeon neither was alexius the third allowed to remain in peaceable possession of the throne the son of the unhappy isaac whose name also was alexius fled from constantinople and hearing that the crusaders had undertaken the siege of zara made them the most magnificent offers if they would afterwards aid him in deposing his uncle his offers were that if by their means he was re-established in his father's dominions he would place the greek church under the authority of the pope of rome lend the whole force of the greek empire to the conquest of palestine and distribute two hundred thousand marks of silver among the crusading army the offer was accepted with a proviso on the part of some of the leaders that they should be free to abandon the design if it met with the disapproval of the pope but this was not to be feared the submission of the schismatic greeks to the see of rome was a greater bribe to the pontiff than the utter annihilation of the saracen power in palestine would have been the crusaders were soon in movement for the imperial city their operations were skilfully and courageously directed and spread such dismay as to paralyze the efforts of the usurper to retain possession of his throne after a vain resistance he abandoned the city to its fate and fled no one knew whither the aged and blind isaac was taken from his dungeon by his subjects and placed upon the throne ere the crusaders were apprised of the flight of his rival his son alexius the fourth was afterwards associated with him in the sovereignty but the conditions of the treaty gave offence to the grecian people whose prelates refused to place themselves under the dominion of the see of rome alexius at first endeavoured to persuade his subjects to admission and prayed the crusaders to remain in constantinople until they had fortified him in the possession of a throne which was yet far from secure he soon became unpopular with his subjects and breaking faith with regard to the subsidies he offended the crusaders war was at length declared upon him by both parties by his people for his tyranny and by his former friends for his treachery he was seized in his palace by his own guards and thrown into prison while the crusaders were making ready to besiege his capital the greeks immediately proceeded to the election of a new monarch and looking about for a man of courage energy and perseverance they fixed upon alexius ducas who with almost every bad quality was possessed of the virtues they needed he ascended the throne under the name of Merzuflis. one of his first acts was to rid himself of his youngest predecessor a broken heart had already removed the blind old isaac no longer a stumbling block in his way and the young alexius was soon after put to death in his prison war to the knife was now declared between the greeks and the franks and early in the spring of the year twelve o four preparations were commenced for an assault upon constantinople the french and venetians entered into a treaty for the division of the spoils among their soldiery for so confident were they of success that failure never once entered into their calculations this confidence led them on to victory while the greeks cowardly as treacherous people always are were paralyzed by a foreboding of evil 
it has been a matter of astonishment to all historians that Merzuflus, with the reputation for courage which he had acquired and the immense resources at his disposal took no better measures to repel the onset of the crusaders their numbers were as a mere handful in comparison with those which he could have brought against them and if they had the hopes of plunder to lead them on the greeks had their homes to fight for and their very existence as a nation to protect after an impetuous assault repulsed for one day but renewed with double impetuosity on another the crusaders lashed their vessels against the walls slew every man who opposed them and with little loss to themselves entered the city Merzuflis fled and constantinople was given over to be pillaged by the victors the wealth they found was enormous in money alone there was sufficient to distribute twenty marks of silver to each knight ten to each squire or servant at arms and five to each archer jewels velvets silks and every luxury of attire with rare wines and fruits and valuable merchandise of every description also fell into their hands and were bought by the trading venetians and the proceeds distributed among the army two thousand persons were put to the sword but had there been less plunder to take up the attention of the victors the slaughter would in all probability have been much greater in many of the bloody wars which defile the page of history we find that soldiers utterly reckless of the works of god will destroy his masterpiece man with unsparing brutality but linger with respect round the beautiful works of art they will slaughter women and children but spare a picture will hew down the sick the helpless and the hoary-headed but refrain from injuring a fine piece of sculpture the latins on their entrance into constantinople respected neither the works of god nor man but vented their brutal ferocity upon the one and satisfied their avarice upon the other many beautiful bronze statues above all price as works of art were broken into pieces to be sold as old metal a finely chiselled marble which could be put to no such vile uses was also destroyed with a recklessness if possible still more atrocious footnote the following is a list of some of the works of art thus destroyed from nicetas a contemporary greek author first a colossal juno from the forum of constantine the head of which was so large that four horses could scarcely draw it from the place where it stood to the palace second the statue of paris presenting the apple to venus third an immense bronze pyramid crowned by a female figure which turned with the wind fourth the colossal statue of bellerophon in bronze which was broken down and cast into the furnace under the inner nail of the horse's hind foot on the left side was found a seal wrapped in a woolen cloth fifth a figure of hercules by lysimachus of such vast dimensions that the thumb was equal in circumference to the waist of a man sixth the ass and his driver cast by order of augustus after the battle of actium in commemoration of his having discovered the position of anthony through the means of an ass driver seventh the wolf suckling the twins of rome eighth the gladiator in combat with a lion ninth the hippopotamus tenth the sphinxes eleventh an eagle fighting with a serpent twelfth a beautiful statue of helen thirteenth a group with a monster somewhat resembling a bull engaged in deadly conflict with a serpent and many other works of art too numerous to mention End footnote. the carnage being over and the spoil distributed six persons were chosen from among the franks and six from among the venetians who were to meet and elect an emperor previously binding themselves by oath 
to select the individual best qualified among the candidates the choice wavered between baldwin count of flanders and boniface marquis of montferrat but fell eventually upon the former he was straightway robed in the imperial purple and became the founder of a new dynasty he did not live long to enjoy his power or to consolidate it for his successors who in their turn were soon swept away in less than sixty years the rule of the franks at constantinople was brought to as sudden and disastrous a termination as the reign of Merzuflis, and this was the grand result of the fifth crusade pope innocent the third although he had looked with no very unfavorable eye upon these proceedings regretted that nothing had been done for the relief of the holy land still upon every convenient occasion he enforced the necessity of a new crusade until the year twelve thirteen his exhortations had no other effect than to keep the subject in the mind of europe every spring and summer detachments of pilgrims continued to set out for palestine to the aid of their brethren but not in sufficient numbers to be of much service these periodical passages were called the passagium martii or the passage of march and the passagium johannis or the passage of the festival of st john these did not consist entirely of soldiers armed against the saracen but of pilgrims led by devotion and in performance of their vows bearing nothing with them but their staff and their wallet early in the spring of twelve thirteen a more extraordinary body of crusaders was raised in france and germany an immense number of boys and girls amounting according to some accounts to thirty thousand were incited by the persuasion of two monks to undertake the journey to palestine they were no doubt composed of the idle and deserted children who generally swarm in great cities nurtured in vice and daring and ready for anything the object of the monks seems to have been the atrocious one of inveigling them into slave ships on pretense of sending them to syria and selling them for slaves on the coast of africa great numbers of these poor victims were shipped at marseilles but the vessels with the exception of two or three were wrecked on the shores of italy and every soul perished the remainder arrived safely in africa and were bought up as slaves and sent off into the interior of the country another detachment arrived at genoa but the accomplices in this horrid plot having taken no measures at that port expecting them all at marseilles they were induced to return to their homes by the genoese end of chapter one part nine recording by linda johnson